as you all know, we're, we're doing um, a series, me, Pastor, and Brandon, on Philippians. And uh, the pastor preached the message last week, um, and he said it's not going to be in order, but we're going to try to cover the whole book of Philippians. I'm going to be speaking out of three today, and then um, Brandon's going to be doing two, and the pastor's going to be wrapping it up at the end. But I just wanted to give you a little refresher of what pastor said last week so that we kind of set the stage of what's going on. Um, the book of Philippians is to the church of Philippi uh, by Paul. And at this point, Paul's in prison. And um, he's writing to the Philippian church. And what is really cool about this is that this church has supported him throughout his entire ministry. He came to Philippi. And usually when ministers come in, they find the local church, they partner up with them, and um, they begin preaching. But when he gets to Philippi, there's no church there. So he's kind of starting from the ground up. And he met, um, on his visit, he met Lydia, who was um, a Proverbs 31 woman. She sold her linens. I mean, she was not one of those women that said, I will just be humble and sit right here. I mean, I'm sure she was submissive to authority, but she was also a woman that got out there and said, I believe the word of God and I will partner with you. So he starts a Philippian church. And this is a people who are affectionate with him because they're writing him, they're supporting him through prayers, they're supporting him through um, financial ministry. So when, when you hear his words in this, this is like talking to his brothers and sisters. This is not um, talking in a condemning way at all. He's saying, hey, I'm with you on this too, just like you're with me on this. And what's interesting also is that he says that he is in prison, however, he's surrounded by the palace guard. So he has the ear of the palace guard, which also has the ear of the officials of that time. So in a roundabout way, the word of God is actually being spread, even though he's in prison for spreading the word of God. I would like to take you to um, chapter 3, and I'm going to briefly tell you that verses 1 through 10, he talks about uh, we don't have confidence in our flesh but we have confidence in Christ alone and that our righteousness is through our faith through Jesus Christ. Basically, not by anything we can do with our hands or our works, but it's only through Jesus. And we skip down to verse 12 and he's talking about running the race. And he says, not that I have already attained this, all but, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. So what, is he, what did Christ take hold of him is something that my mind would be questioning. I think he's referring to our walk and our journey with God. And that the journey and the race is actually that relationship and that progression throughout time. And that we never actually get to a point where we say, hey, I've made it. It's a constant journey with the Lord because that's what relationship with God is. is it's always a journey. Um, so, a little background on Paul. He's on his way to Damascus, and he was on his way to persecute Christians, actually, and his name at the time was Saul, and he was stopped, and he was um, taken hold of, apprehended by God. He was blinded momentarily. God seized him and changed his life, and from that moment on, forever, he began preaching the gospel. So, I believe when he says to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me, I think his mind goes back to that moment of here I was thinking, um, and you'll see in the word too, he says, if anyone could be proclaimed as righteous as me, I am from this lineage, I am from this bloodline, I am a Jew of all Jews. So he is the Jew of all Jews who's going to persecute other Jews, and he's blind and apprehended by the Lord, and God's saying, you got it wrong, and this is what it is. So when he says to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me, Christ took hold of him in that moment and changed his life. And that's what I believe he's starting to think about and his heart's starting to get melted over when he thinks about the Lord. Christ took me in that moment and changed my life. Or God took me in that moment and changed my life. So he does, the reason he does what he does in sharing the gospel is because Jesus chased him down. I mean, we, he didn't see... Yes, he did see Jesus, um, but that's what I mean. Jesus, Jesus chased him down. He seized him. He took hold of him. Verse 14, he says, forgetting what is behind 
and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I like this because he says, I'm forgetting what is behind. And I think still his mind and his heart goes back to that moment when he's saying, I can't believe I did all that to my brothers and sisters. And it's easy for us to get trapped in shame. And I believe that this is his way of saying, I'm forgetting that. I'm forgetting what I did to them. I know it was horrible, and my heart aches over it when I'm in the shower every morning. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me for the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's putting down the old life, and he's looking forward to the new life in Christ. Now, in verse 14, he talks about goals. What are some of the goals that we have? Let's start short-term goals, like um, a day-to-day goal or a month-to-month goal. If you are, I was going to say a stay-at-home mom, but usually any woman, um, we're usually the laundry doers in the house, right? Your main goal may be, today, I want to make sure I get them wash, dry, fold, and put away. And that's a big goal, because sometimes it's wash and Maybe a few hours later, they do get dried, and then they get dumped on a couch or something. Hey, I try the best I can. I I live in a busy house, too. Um, What are some other day-to-day goals that we may have? Today, I need to get the yard mowed. I got a letter from the HOA, right? (laughs) Um, And then for some of us, we have a hang-up. In our day-to-day goal, whether it's a a, a deep wounded hurt or it's a habit, our day-to-day goal may be, Today, I'm getting up, and I'm surrendering that again to Christ. And he says in his word, I die daily that I may live in Christ. And that dying daily is, I put down that fleshly part of me, realizing that I am so human, and I'm giving it to Christ. And so my goal today is to die to myself and realize, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be me. And then if you get down to verse 16, it says, Only let us live up to what we have already attained. And I was reading this, and it was like the brakes were put on. And I I couldn't get my eyes to go past this. I mean, eventually I read through the whole chapter, yeah, and I studied it, but it was like I kept coming back to this verse. What does he mean by that? Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Is he talking about these goals? What goals have I accomplished in life? Because sometimes I set goals, and I'm like, I never met this one. I've still got to meet this one. I don't think there's any way in the world I'm going to meet that one, though I want to. What is he speaking about when he says, let us live up to what we have already attained? Our ultimate goal, right, is heaven. Is that what he's talking about? Let's press on through this life and earth so that we can ultimately attain heaven. I don't really think so. I think sometimes as we have all these goals in life, and though they are good, you know, let's pay off the credit cards, let's pay off the house, let's mow that lawn, let's fold that laundry, let me get over this hang up today. I think we get caught up in that goal and we get very narrow-minded. I think sometimes the expectations that we have on ourselves or the expectations that we feel from others cause us to have that tunnel vision and everything we do is about how do I work toward that? How do I work toward that? How do I work toward that goal? But he's saying let's live up to what we have already attained. And many of us get paralyzed when we feel like we can't attain that goal. We say it's too hard. And you sit down and say forget it. I'm not even gonna try. Anytime you feel the pressure to attain a goal or to solve life's problems on your own, you will suffer from depression and feelings of abandonment because you weren't meant to attain your goals by yourself. When I became a mother to Isaiah, I had a friend. She's just like me. She was no Bible scholar. She was just a mom. She passed on some advice to me, and she said, the Bible doesn't tell us to raise our children to be independent. The Lord expects us to raise our children to be dependent on us 
And as they are dependent on us, we are training them through our daily life. We are training them to be dependent on the Lord. So throughout their entire life, they're constantly going to be dependent. And that's not a bad thing. If they're dependent on us, we'll train them right. And we teach them to be dependent on the Lord. What happens when they become adults? Think about when you run into a problem. What is your immediate response? And I'm guilty of this too is why I'm saying it. How am I going to fix this? What am I going to do about this? And you start feeling alone. I start feeling alone. Do you start feeling abandoned? Because you're trying to fix it yourself. We need to lean back on him. How are, Lord, how are we going to do this? How are you going to help me through this? Because he's the one that puts his perfection on our imperfection. And you know, there are verses in the Bible where it talks about that you may become perfect. I am told that if you, do a, if you do a word study on that word perfect, you probably can ask Brandon or Gregory because they're our linguists and they, they dig into the word, they go back into the culture. That perfect actually means completeness. And where do we get our completeness? In the Lord. And he even says in his word, my power is made perfect in your weakness. He has the power and he's even saying, my power is not perfect unless I place it on your weakness. You know why that is? He can't move and live and breathe in this earth without us, right? Because in the beginning of time, he gave us the world. He says, I'm placing you here to govern and to guide. I have, I have this power. I am the almighty God, but it is not perfect until I place it onto your weak area, and then it becomes perfect because it's complete, because it's complete in you and me together doing this. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. The first thing I think we need to attain, and it's not really something that we grasp, it's something that we just relax into, is our sonship and our daughtership. That was bought on the cross, right? It's not something that we have to work toward. What was Jesus about when he came to this earth? Yes, he gave us a moral guideline. But his ultimate goal here was for our hearts, for our salvation, to bridge that gap of our sin and the Father. Because the Father's there and he's reaching, but we have this sin that's standing in between. And Jesus came down to say, I'm taking that and I'm moving it aside. And I've come that you may have life and you may have it to the full. And you may have it in me and the Father. So he came in love for us to make us family. To make us his sons and daughters. And I think we lose our identity when our identity becomes in the day-to-day and in the goals. Though they are good goals. Good goals to meet and good goals to have. But if you place your identity in that, You've lost your identity in Christ. And what he came is to give you identity in him. If we're his sons and his daughters, we're not laborers, we're not slaves or servants. And it reminds me of the message that pastor spoke a couple Sundays ago about um, sitting at the king's table, sitting at King David's table, sitting at the father's table, getting everything because you are a joint heir with Christ. You're not the one who carries out the tray of the drinks or the food. You're not the one that comes along when everyone's done eating and you sweep the crumbs off, and if you're lucky, you get some of that. You're the one that sits at the table with the Father. You are the king's own heir, right? Let's not forget that and lose our identity. That's our identity. We nuzzle up with him, just like your kids do. They sit on your lap. And they, and they nuzzle up in your chest to smell your smell because that's comfort. Smell the smell of the Father because that's comfort. That's where your identity is. Paul says in five, Galatians 5.1, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened by the yoke of slavery. 
And then in Galatians 5, 7, Paul says, you were running a good race. Who cut you off? Who kept you from obeying the truth? And I see a lot of things in pictures. And when I see him talking about running this race of life, and what do we say that the race is actually? Just our relationship with the Lord, right? We're going through life compared to as a race. It's actually our relationship with the Lord. Who cut you off? What I see is this detour sign. And you were going the right path, and you, there's this detour. And you start going this way. I've got to pay off that debt. I've got to get this house straightened up. I've got to get these kids to bed. Even that, it's a task, right? You go through life as a task, it's a task. But what you have attained is sonship and daughtership. Don't, don't let that confuse you. Don't let running that good race, who threw you off? Who threw you off? Did somebody say something to you? Is it your own internal voice? Don't allow that. Your relationship is with the Father. Go through life relating to the Father. Even tucking those little kids in bed, you're relating to the Father. You're taking care of those precious little ones. Even mowing the grass. You can be relating to the Father during that. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God by, God by works so that no one can boast. So the salvation that you have is by faith. And it's not by what you can do in your works and your hands so that anyone can take credit for it, is basically what he was saying. And early in that chapter, as I mentioned before, he says, if anybody could say they are holy and worthy, it's me because I came of this lineage and I'm the Jew of all Jews. But he says, I count it all as loss to know Christ. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, but when a set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption to sonship and daughtership. Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son unto our hearts, a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but you are a child. And since you are a child, God made you also an heir. You're going to hear me say a lot of verses today because I want you to see that our relationship and our sonship and our daughtership is, is grounded in the word. It's a concept that's grounded in the word. He said you received a spirit of adoption. Now, being an adoptive mother, I'll tell you this. We got our son um, when he was born, and we adopted him. And when the whole process was complete... We got in the mail a birth certificate that says Philip and Shelley are his parents. So in all legal purposes, we're his parents. It's as if I birthed him from my own womb. So when we receive that spirit of adoption from God, whatever passed or we let attach itself to us or claim us as a son or a daughter... When we receive that spirit of adoption from the Father, it says, God. My dad is God. And your, your bloodline and your lineage is changed to his because you belong to him. And you're an heir to his throne. He deposits his spirit into you as a seal of ownership. And all you had to do was you don't have to work at it. You just turn and lift. And he says, I love you. Bam, there's my spirit. And that's my seal on you of hope. That's my seal that you're mine. You have my spirit into you. Romans 8.15 says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is such a tender word. Abba, Abba, you are my Abba. You know, I was hanging around a Jewish family, and I heard the children, instead of saying dad or father or pop, Abba, 
And as soon as I heard Abba come from these little children to their dad, it sent chills up me. Because when I think of Abba, I think of my Abba. Isaiah 43, 1 says, Don't be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You're mine. He placed a label on you. You're mine. And then if you read further down in there, this is very encouraging. When you walk through, when you go through, when you battle, all these things, it's listed, I will be with you. It doesn't say you'll be saved from it. He said, I'll be with you. I'll be with you through it. I'll be with you through it. Verse 4 in that same chapter of Isaiah 43, 4 says, Because you are precious to me. You are honored, and I love you. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with my unfailing kindness. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. What we have attained first was a belonging as a son, as a daughter. And living up to that, don't be tripped up by those words, living up to, or attain like it's a goal you have to grab and achieve. It's something you just surrender to. And you open your hands, here I am. This is me. I'm your daughter. I'm your son. The second thing we need to attain is the knowledge that God equips. Many of us are waiting for that bang moment in life that propels us into our destiny. If only I can get this, if I can only get that degree, if I can only get that promotion, that's going to send me out. That's going to send me over the edge from this rut that I've been in, and that's going to propel me into the destiny that I feel like I'm here for. Your destiny is not defined by a shining moment. Your destiny is wrapped up in the sum total of who God created you. That's your destiny. Who you are right now, without any letters behind your name, without that supreme paycheck, without any other title that you feel that you have to attain, your destiny is wrapped up in the sum total of who you are, and all you have to do is be. It's not waiting on your goal. You just be. You are the whole package. You are perfect. You know why? Not because you're sinless. Because perfect, like the word says in the Bible, you are complete in him. He places his power on your weakness, and you're perfect. That's what makes you perfect. That's what makes you complete. God gives us all uniques and talents that are born within us, things that we can do with our hands, words that we express with our hearts, a special love language that we can pour on someone else. That is God-given and nothing you have to work for. It's born in there. Whether you want to use it or not, it's born in there. And it's something he'll never take away because it's a gift. And God gives his gifts without repentance. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, for which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God prepared it. Like Jeremiah talks about being formed in the womb. God prepared that when he formed you. God prepared you for that. It wasn't something you had to do. God did it. And it, it doesn't take a missions trip to heal a heart, though I'm very, very glad that we are a church that supports missions. But some of us don't go for a reason or another. But it doesn't take a missions trip to heal hearts right here where you are. If God expects you to do something, he'll equip you for it. And um, you may ask yourself, why am I working here? Why am I going to this church? Why do I attend this fitness class? Everything about your life is intentional by God. God is very intentional over you. The place you live, the place you work, 
the place you exercise, place you go to school, your neighbors. He is intentional about where he placed you. And Psalms 37, 23 backs that up. He says the footsteps of the righteous or the footsteps of the good are ordered by God. So when I see this and I close my eyes, because like I told you, I see in pictures, the footsteps of the good are ordered by the Lord. If I close my eyes and say, okay, you've ordered them, and I'm standing on the threshold of um, this gaping canyon, and I take a step out, and what I see him doing is throwing stones, like those plated flat, like you'd put in your garden, like the stone that hovers in the air over the canyon. So I close my eyes and I just walk. I walk on the steps that he throws in front of me because we're trusting, right? The footsteps of the good are ordered. You're just trusting. If I take that next step, I know it's going to be there because he's put it there for me. He says he's ordered it already, preordained it before I was even born in my, in my mother's womb. Many of your best works for him are going to be through touching people, just being yourself in your everyday life. Many of the best works that God's going to do in you are going to be touching people who are right beside you, doing everyday life with you. And um, you may have heard it called marketplace ministry. You say, I'm no theologian, I don't know the word. Marketplace ministry is just that. Wherever you are, you're being Jesus. And don't get tripped up on that. I mean, I can't be that perfect. Like Tim was saying, I can't be as perfect as Jesus. Or that was Greg, sorry. That was Greg. I can't be as perfect as Jesus. But even Paul is an example of being Jesus to the guards, right? He's not perfect, but he's just opening his mouth and he's being the voice of the Lord. I'm just here. I just show up, right? I just show up. And it's up to him to do it all. But don't be blinded in the goals and the everyday tasks that you can't see. He equips you. He equips you for your call. For most people, that church sign right there may be the only thing they see. And they may be driving right past it every day. And they won't come in. But if, if they could see that sign... But if they experience the Jesus in you at work, at the gym, that's what's going to draw them in, right? They're not just going to be driving one day, oh, there's a church I think I'll visit. No. They're going to experience the Jesus in you, and you may not even have to say Jesus. You may just be love. And anytime we do love, hey, we're human, and it's hard to love. But we submit to the Lord, and we submit to Jesus, and we accept his love, then it becomes easy to love. And the love that they experience will be Jesus' love through us, and that's what will bring them into the door. Love will draw. The word says, um, no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws. And that doesn't mean that he says, oh, I'm going to choose you to place my Spirit on, or you to place my Spirit on, and um, you guys are just doomed forever. No, the Spirit draws through us because we're willing to surrender ourselves to be loved to others. And when we step in that gap, just like Jesus did, we're just stepping in that gap and saying, okay, here I am, you do it. And we be loved when he tells us to do something, they experience Jesus. And that's the Spirit drawing them, like the Word says, the Spirit draws If any of you have watched the news lately or been on Facebook, I don't get much of the news, but I will see it in the Facebook feed. People are dying lately, and I don't mean just physically. I mean emotionally. Here recently we had um, a small child that lost his life to an alligator in Florida. We've had a child mauled by an ape. We have grieving parents over that, right? We've had the Orlando thing go on at the club, a lot of lives were lost. A lot of families are hurting right now because of that. We've had Dallas. We're having riots. People are hating each other. 
I was talking to my husband, if any time would be a good time for um, ISIS, ISIL, or whatever they want to call themselves to come in and attack, this would be the time, right? Because we're dividing up from each other within. They're already wrecking themselves. Let's just go in and mix it up a little bit, right? We'll just annihilate them all. They're doing it to themselves. Now, I know I'm not talking to West Town here because West Town, from what my family has experienced, is very loving, very loving. We wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for West Town being loving on us. So uh, what I'm saying is what we're seeing in the news, what we're experiencing around us, our neighbor, our coworker, experiencing physical death, emotional death, they're needing the Jesus within us. And you say, who am I? I'm just a homemaker. Um, I'm just a clerk. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a painter. The Bible says in Romans 8, 19, creation waits in eager expectation for the sons and daughters to be revealed. Creation waits in eager expectation for the sons and daughters to be revealed. They're not waiting for a new law to be passed. They're not waiting for us to pull out the Ten Commandments. They're waiting to see sons and daughters revealed, that relational thing that we have with God. That's what they're waiting to see. How do I see family? Have you heard that, um, that cliche? There's a God-shaped hole in your heart only God can fill. Well, it really is true. There is a God place in you that only God can fill. And even people who don't know God have that place. They don't know they're looking for God. But when they experience the love of the Lord through you, that's how they know this is what I've been missing. I just want to belong. And the Lord makes us feel like we belong. We're not alone. We're not abandoned whenever we're going in a, through a situation. They want Jesus, not judgment. Matthew 25, 35 through 40 says, he's talking to his, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick, you were with me. Um, when I needed clothes, you gave me clothes. And the word says, Lord, when did we do that for you? When were you sick? When were you hungry that we ministered to you in this way? And he says, I tell you the truth. Whenever you did it for the least of these brothers, sisters, you've done it to me. So when we open up Christ's love to them, we're, we're loving back on the Father, the way he's loved on us. John 13, 35 says, By this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The Lord wants us um, not to show a path to heaven. This is the way. Here's the arrow. Take heaven this way. Right there. This is heaven. He wants us to bring heaven here. That's what Jesus did. He left the throne and brought heaven here by way of the cross. Where will our unexpected joy come from in our series of unexpected joy? Through this. I believe this message was birthed out of a common struggle that we have, whether we're all experiencing right now. I see what's going on in the news. I see what's going on through my family, my friends. I feel so incapable. What do I do if I can do anything out of this? Our joy will come from first, attaining the knowledge of who we are in Him, our identity in Him, and second, attaining the knowledge that it is He who equips our hands to do, He has prepared us to do, and it is not by our own works. You know, Jesus said, I only see what the Father doing. I only do what I see the Father doing. You know what this does? It takes the pressure off. It takes the pressure off because all you have to be is His all you have to be is his child. All you have to be is just be. Just open up and be. And he shows you what to do. I see what the Father doing. I watch you do it. Okay, and then I do it. That's even what Jesus said. 
Only let us live up to what we have already attained, our identity in Christ. That's it. Knowing his love, relaxing in our identity in him. It's not something we work toward. It's something we relax in. Like your house with your family. You go in and you relax on the couch. You relax in the bed. Did you know when you lay down at night, the Lord and the Spirit broods over you? Have you ever done it to your kids? You watch them sleep. Oh, how precious. I don't want them to wake up right now. No. Oh, how precious. Oh, how precious. You were praying to him, and the next thing you know, you woke up, and you were like, oh, God, I fell asleep on you while I was praying. Or you were worshiping, and you fell asleep. Oh, God, you know, you wake up. He's going to be so angry at me. Are you kidding? He's just like us because we're made in his image, right? So that when we fall asleep, and he's watching us sleep, oh, how precious. That one's mine. I made that one. I love her. I love him. When they wake up, this world is going to feel me because of my love through her, because of my love through him. What you have attained is not something that you could grasp or earn with your hands. It was bought on the cross. Release yourself of the pressure to try to grasp it. It's not something you can grasp and hold on to. It's something you open up to. Remember the Bible talking about John, one of the disciples? We used to laugh growing up because when you read John, he's always referring to, and the beloved. I'm the beloved. The beloved. And the beloved said this, and beloved, the beloved witnessed this. I'm the beloved. And at, at first, it may have seemed like he had a little bit of pride here. I am the beloved. Actually, I think he just knew his identity. It wasn't prideful at all. He knew his identity in Christ. You know, Jesus sent out 72, he sent out 12. They're going to do my works. They're going to preach my gospel. And there were the 12 that sit around the table with him. And there was a time the Bible speaks about, they're all saying, I'm the favorite. It's me. I'm the favorite. You know, and John, I'm the beloved. You may see someone around you, and you feel like, I wish I had that relationship with the Lord. I wish I felt like I was the favorite. I wish I felt like I was the beloved. I wish I spoke like him or her about the Lord. I wish I had that biblical knowledge. I wish I had, I wish I had. You know what the difference between John was and the rest of the disciples? The word says God doesn't have favorites, right? There's no favorites. It was John's choice to be that close. And it's something we all can have. It's a choice. As powerful as and mighty as the Lord is to move heaven and earth and to make changes and to create, the most beautiful gift he gave us was our free will to choose to come. I extend to you the call to come, be mine. Come, be my daughter. Come, be my son. Come, be in relationship with me. It's a choice. And yet we'll all, when we choose Christ, we'll all make it to heaven. But there's also another choice. Do I want to be that close? Do I want to be that close to him? And that's what John said. All the disciples, they were going to heaven, and the ones they ministered to, they were going to heaven too. But John said, I want to just be that close. And we never see in the Bible it was something that he had to do extra things. I'm going to be the one that takes the offering. I'm going to be the one that um, hands out that bread to the 5,000. I'm going to be the one that pulls in that boat when he needs it or go gets that donkey. I'm going to be the one to do all this stuff because I'm going to make it to sit right next to him in heaven. I'm going to make it to be the favorite. John just said, I want to be that close to you. I want to sit next to you. I want to put my head on your chest and I want to hear your heartbeat because it gives me peace. 
And that's our choice. We all get it. We're going to heaven. But where's our choice? I just want to be that close. Relaxing into him. Relaxing into his embrace. How do I do that when I've got all this stuff competing for my attention everywhere? Worship. I don't sing. Y'all don't want to hear me sing, you may say. Don't ask me to sing. You don't have to sing. But you can listen. Did you know when the Israelites went into battle, it wasn't the guys with the swords that were in the front. It was the worshipers. We lit the flags, playing the flutes. Can you imagine what a sight that would have been? (laughs) Those guys are coming to fight us and they send that in the front? (laughs) You know why? Because the worshipers weren't for them. The worshipers were for them, behind them, to encourage them, to say, this is how mighty our God is. This is what our God can do. This is how much our God loves. That's what worship does. It takes you into the temple, past the outer court, past the people who sing his praise, and behind the veil. You're behind the veil into the intimacy with the Lord. You don't have to be an amazing singer. You can just turn it on and listen to it. But worship reminds us of who we are in him and what he can do. Now, there is some, there is some great Christian music out there. And one of my favorites, because it relates to my life, is where she sings about, um, call me please because I can't find my phone. <laughs> Between me and my kids, the phone is always somewhere. I can't find it. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But worship is different. Worship is the music that says, you are my God. You are my supply. You are my source. You are my everything. Or it identifies who you are to him. I'm your child. I'm your beloved. One of my favorites, and I will listen. My husband can attest to this. He goes, again, I'm like, this is how I put on my game face. This song, No Longer Slaves. You can YouTube it. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Because the reality is Shelley battles anxiety. I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. And like I see in pictures, one of the verse says, you split the sea so I could walk right through it. And that's what I see him doing. Like the children of Israel, there was a way they had to go or they would be trampled and taken by the Egyptians. And I picture this. Here I walk. Here's everything in front of me. It's the thrashing water of my everyday life and my emotional and my stress. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. And it all builds up like a wall like this alongside me. It's not gone. It's there. What do you say? When you pass through, when you go through, I will be with you. So what does he do? the water divides. When you split the sea and I can walk right through it, I am a child of God. I walk through on dry ground. Because why? You're a child of God, not something you had to attain. Just because you're a child, he splits the sea so you can walk right through it because you're his child. How do you get closer? Choose that worship song that gets you in gets this in, not the hands, gets this, this in to the inner court, this into the surrender with the Father. I hear you. I see you. I know what you've called me. I know what you've labeled me as your own. I accept what I have already attained. Only let me live up to what I have already attained, my identity in you. My identity in you. Attain the knowledge that you are wrapped up in him, his unconditional love. Amen?